today. Take your Bibles, please, and um, go to Exodus chapter 3. Um, this week, uh, with uh, Resurrection Sunday, uh, three weeks away, we are going to look at, uh, start a series of teachings on leading up to that, um, that wonderful day in two weeks from now. And so today I'm, I'm excited to teach with you the Passover lamb. I thought it would be good to look back at the roots of understanding the Passover. And then uh, we'll look at uh, from the Old Testament of the, in Exodus. And then we will end, we'll come to the New Testament, and we will consider Jesus Christ as our Passover, as it says here on the slide, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And hopefully, if you don't know anything about this, by the end of the day, you will know more about it. And if you do know about it, maybe you'll know a little more about this wonderful truth of our Passover lamb. To understand this story and, and what the Passover is about, incidentally, um, now I know not all Jews celebrate the same months, but majority of Judaism the Passover is actually this year the same weekend as Easter. I believe it's uh, Saturday, or sun, Friday or Saturday is the Passover this year of, of the weekend we celebrate Easter. So um, they almost coincide this year. Um, but um, to go back to uh, the children of Israel were in bondage. They were in Egypt. Um, they had grown to over, it says over 600,000 men besides women and children. So scholars estimate you know, there could have been a couple million of the children of Israel from the seed of Abraham that were in bondage in Egypt. And if you remember the story, it had gotten so bad that the, um, they uh, wanted the midwives to kill the children. And then the, they went out and they slew the, the male sons. It was getting so bad, the kind of bondage and um, servitude that they were under, and they cried to God to deliver them from their bondage. And God sent them the man Moses. And here at the burning bush, God tells Moses um, what he's going to do, what he wants him to do and what he ends up doing, and what's going to happen. And this is at, during his experience at the burning bush in Exodus 3, verse 16. It says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, now the word Lord there, I think most of you know this, but if you don't, I'll let you know, is all caps. You see that? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And most Bibles, the King James Version, the NASB, and most scriptures, when you see that, it is actually not the word Lord. It is the name we have over here, Yahweh. It is the name of God. So as I'm reading, I'm going to say Yahweh when we're reading, when I have that word, all caps, Lord, just so that you understand why I'm saying Yahweh in those verses. So, um, in verse 16 again, So go gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. They will pay heed to what you say, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God. He said, you're going to go to the elders of Israel. They're going to say, yes, this is great. And then we're going to send you to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him you, you need to go. In verse 19, but I know, God says, I know the king of Egypt will not permit you to go, except under compulsion. The only way he's going to make you go is if he is compelled to let you go. So, God told him this before anything happened. This is He's at the burning of the bush. He hasn't even gone back into Egypt yet. So, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst, and after that he will let you go. I will grant the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters. Thus you will plunder the Egyptians. God said, you're not going to only go. You're going to go with wealth. I'm sending you out, and you're going to take the wealth of Egypt with you. Wow. wow. That's quite a promise. And this is at the burning bush. So 
So Moses goes, and of course he does exactly what he said. He goes to the elders of Israel, say, Lord God appeared to me. They're like, like great, great, we're going to go. He goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't know your God. Matter of fact, you know, I don't care that you did this to me. So you know what? I'm going to cause more labor. I'm going to make them. We used to get straw for them. They're going to have to go get their own straw now. So I'm going to, I'm going to make their work more. How about that, Moses? Huh? How about that? So then we have a series of plagues that came upon the land of Egypt. And just as a review, here were the plagues that came on the land of Egypt. There was the plague of blood, where the rivers turned to blood. And then there were frogs everywhere. Frogs. And then there was lice. Lice. Everybody got lice. You guys ever dealt with lice? Imagine the whole nation dealing with lice. Swarms of flies. Flies everywhere. Pestilence of the livestock, where the livestock dialed. Boils. They got boils on their bodies. This one was great. Thunderstorm of hail and fire. And then fire would appear as a hailstorm and fire. Locusts. Locusts, plagues of locusts that ate all the land's crops. Darkness, there was darkness for three days, three full days of darkness where they couldn't even see in front of their face. And then finally, which is the tenth and final plague, is the death of the firstborn. And it was after this tenth plague that the children of Israel were released from their captivity. But um, God provided a way for the children of Israel not to suffer the consequences of this final plague. And to pick this up, let's look at Exodus 11. Exodus chapter 11. It says in verse 1, Now Yahweh said to Moses, One more plague. This is the tenth one. One more plague. I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that each man ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. Yahweh gave, people, gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people." Moses said, thus says Yahweh, about midnight, I am going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. And the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn for the slave girl who is behind the millstones, and the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, well, that's good enough. Uh, there, well, no, moreover, there shall be a great cry in the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as never shall be. In every household, every place, there, the firstborn was going to die in the land of Egypt. Then we come to Exodus chapter 12, which is how God was going to redeem the Israelites from this plague. Chapter 12, verse 1, Now Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. This incident began the Hebrew calendar. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their fathers. Households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb... Then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be unblemished, male a year old. You will take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. So they were to select an unblemished male of the first year lamb on the tenth of the first month. And then on the fourteenth, they were to take that lamb and, and they were to slay it. They were to sacrifice it. And here it says at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So then they were to take the blood after they sacrificed. They were to take blood and they were to put it on the side post and the lintel above the door and the side posts of the door over their households. 
And then it says, they shall eat the flesh. Then that night, they would eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they were to eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So they would eat the lamb and unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, no boiling the lamb, uh, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left it, until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Passover, get it? And our, no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood of the Lamb is what saved them from certain death of the firstborn. They slayed the, the sacrifice, the Lamb, and the blood saved them. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the timing of this. Um, uh, and so the first thing I, I thought I would cover with you are biblical time reckonings. Um, and these are just a couple things to understand. Um, if you don't understand this, sometimes, you know, in our Western world, you know, we have a solar calendar. We have the months January through December. We have some months are 30 days, some are 31 days. February's 28, and then every four years it's 29. You know, we have all these rules that we're used to, but it's a whole different culture. This is the Hebrew calendar um, and the Hebrew day. The Hebrew day started at sunset. Well, you may think that's weird, but ours starts at midnight. So which more weird, right? It started at sunset, the Hebrew day started. The Hebrew calendar is a lunar calendar. It's based on the movement of the, loon, of the moon, um, and it's a 28 day. Every month is 28 days. Uh, lunar, lunar actually is more like 28 and a third. It doesn't, the way the moon runs, it doesn't actually work out to 28. But in reference, it's like 28 days, okay? Um, so when they, would, when they sacrificed on the 14th, of the month, right? It was halfway through the lunar calendar. A lunar, if you know, a lunar calendar starts with a new moon, right? When you go look out and there's no moon in the sky. That's the start of the Hebrew calendar year. When the moon is full moon is the 14th. At full moon is the middle of the Hebrew month, every calendar. So that's the, so that's the way it's a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. The first year that started here in Exodus in, um, at the time of Moses, it was called Abib. When the, when the children of Israel went to the Babylonian captivity, the month's names changed, and this month, which was Abib at this time, is now today called Nisan. Isn't there an automobile called Nisan? <laughs> Nisan? I mean, it's, it's Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, Nisan. And also, I should let you know that the daytime, they didn't have watches. Like, I don't know how they did this, because I don't know how to live without a watch or my, you know, my phone and look what time it is. But they did. They didn't have clocks. They didn't have watches. So during the daylight hours, they separated them into 12 hours. You know, the first hour of the day, the second hour of the day, the third hour of the day. And, um, and so basically the third hour is about 9 a.m., sixth hour is about noon, ninth hour is about 3 p.m., and then sunset started a new day. And that's kind of the way that the Hebrew calendar rolled. Um, now, the days are going to be different. You know, like, like in June, you have long days. So your hours are more than 60 minutes. But in, in the winter months, your hours are shorter than 60 minutes because they don't have as much light. But it was, they basically separated the day into 12 hours. Got it? Okay, now, here's my problem with what's written in the NASB. It says that the Israelites are to kill it at twilight. Now, for years, I have, I, I have always said that, that the timing of the killing of the Passover lamb is probably in the afternoon, around 3 p.m. And I was taught this, and I believe it. I still believe it, and I'll, I'll share it with you in a minute. But I, I have to be honest with you. I never really worked it for myself. 
I took the words of someone else. And I trusted them, and they were right. But, I don't know about you, but you know, like if someone tells you that someone said something, that's nice, but if you hear it from yourself, what that person says, right? I like to go to the source as much as possible. So I said, you know what, I'm going to look at this. I really want to know what this says. So you can tell, ask my family. I got all my books on my desk. I got, my, I got my, all my encyclopedias. I got my Tanakh. I got my, the Hebrew, my Mishnah. And I, I started looking at this, really looking at it. And I got so excited. Now, some of you, you're not going to care. You're going to say, John, just tell me what it means. <laughs> but some of you like to look at stuff for yourself. And you like to read it yourself. I do. And I had, but you know, for here it is all this time. I was like, what does this mean? Because when I think twilight, I think that time after the sun is set, before, you know, what we call golden hour in the, right, in the, in the film, after, you know, we have that, be- and, the, and the light goes totally out. That's what I think of twilight. This isn't twilight here. This in the Hebrew is the words, ben harabayim, har- ben harabayim. Um, the word evening is what the King James Version says for this, rather than twilight. The word evening is the generic, it's, it's the Hebrew word arab. Um, but this here, that's used here, is actually this phrase, ben ha'abayim. Um, it's not just the word evening. But the problem you have with that, when you're, like, you're trying to look at this phrase, you can't do a phrase search on Hebrew very well. I don't know if you ever tried it. It's not a real easy thing to do. You know, I look at Arab, and I think that's used like hundreds of times. So um, I read what this one guy says. Well, um, anyways, just to let you know, the words ben ha'abayim means between the two evenings. That's what this phrase means, between the two evenings. And I believe, and we'll look at this, it's the time between noon, when the sun is at its highest, and sunset, from the sun's at its highest at noon, and sunset. And in there, that time of day, is Ben Har Abayim. Now, the reason this is going to be significant is when we get to look at Jesus. But the Jews didn't believe in Jesus, right? So what did they think? That's what I want to know. What did they think? Not to what the Christians think. What do the Jews think about the timing of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb? That's what I wanted to find out. So I got my books out. Um, and I believe that the going down of the sun, Deuteronomy 6, wins as a stunt. The sun reaches its high point at noon, and then it starts to go down all the way till sunset. And that's what it says in Deuteronomy 6.6 6 as the timing. So I started looking up encyclopedias. That's where I started my look. Um, and, oh, oh, this is, this is first I, f- I found this one guy said this. He said, this phrase, this is some guy's article. He said, this phrase, ben ha'abayim, is only used 12 times. Now, do me a favor, if any of you guys ever write something on the Internet, okay? If you say something in the Bible is only used 12 times, would you list the 12 times? You know, it's like, okay, it's used 12 times. What are they? Just give me the verse. You don't need to just give me the verse references. But no, he just said that. It's listed. He just throws it out there. It's like, well, what are they? So then I had to look. I had to get out my Tanakh. Had to compare it every time I think it's used. And, and then I had to check my Hebrew letters up there to see it. I could only find 11. I don't know where this 12th one is he's talking about, but I found it used 11 times, and they're all in your notes here. Um, at least 11 times that this phrase is used in the Bible. Um, it's used for the timing of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. It was to be sacrificed between the evenings at Ben Ha Arbaim. It is used for the time of the evening sacrifice. They had a daily sacrifice. They sacrificed a lamb in the morning, and they sacrificed the evening sacrifice, which is actually at Ben Ha Arbaim is when they would sacrifice what we would call the afternoon, really. The evening sacrifice was done at ben ha Abarim. When the high priest burned the evening incense was at this time, and then finally it's used one other place. When the children, remember when the children of Israel were eating manna? 
And, and God said, there's quails, go out, and you can eat flesh. They ate flesh at Ben-Har Abayim, and then after that, they, they ate manna for the next 40 years. But the last time they ate meat was at this time of day, uh, before the manna came. Those are the only uses, and they're all, all the verses for those are in your notes, um, and they're up here on this chart, uh, the 11 times that I could find this phrase in the Hebrew. There's probably one more if that guy's right, but I don't know where it is. If you do find it, let me know. But I know those 11 times this is used in the Bible. So let's look at what some of these, uh, here, this is from Easton's Revised Bible Dictionary. When was the Passover lamb to be slain? The Hebrews reckoned two evenings of each day, as appears from Exodus. It means between the two evenings. The first evening was that period when the sun was verging towards setting, and the second evening, the moment of actual sunset. This is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. The Passover lamb was killed in the time of the Second Temple in the court where all of their Kodashim were slaughtered, in keeping with the Deuteronomic prescription, and it was incumbent upon every man and woman to fulfill this obligation. The time between the two evenings, Ben Ha Arbaim, was construed to mean afternoon and until nightfall, from noon until nightfall. That's from the Jewish Encyclopedia. From the Cyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Eschil, 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 Literature, <laughs> McClintock and Strong. I'm talking fast, so I'm going to blur some things. From the afternoon to the disappearing of the sun, the first evening being from the time when the sun begins to decline from its vertical or noontime point towards the west, and the second from its going down to the vanishing out of sight, but as the Pascal lamb was slain, it generally took place from 2.30 to 5.30 p.m. in the afternoon. We should have deemed it superfluous to add that such faithful followers, such as the Jewish traditions of Rabbi Sadia, Rashi, Kimchi, Ralbag, especially espoused this definition of the ancient Jewish canons. Now Rashi most distinctly declares, from the sixth hour, noon, and upwards is called between the two evenings, because the sun begins to set for the evening. Hence, it appears to me that the phrase between the two evenings denotes the hours between the evening of the day, which they call noon, and the evening of the night, which is sunset, between the two evenings. That's from uh, McClintock and Strong. So those are like some encyclopedias. Oh, and Edersheim. Edersheim's another one that people look at. Um, Alfred Edersheim. The name of Passover in Hebrew, Pesach, and in Aram Aramaic and Greek, Pascha, is derived from a root which means to step over. And this points back to the historical origin of the festival. It was ordained that the head of every house should, on the tenth day of Nisan, select either a lamb or a kid of the goats of the first year, and without blemish the lamb was to be killed on the eve of the fourteenth, or rather, as the phrase is, between the two evenings. From contemporary testimony of Josephus and from Talmudic authorities, there can be no doubt that at the time of our Lord it was regarded as the interval between the sun's commencing to decline at noon and its actual disappearance at sunset. So those are all encyclopedias, and I thought, okay, that's good. But it wasn't good enough. Because, you know, all these are written like, what, within the last couple hundred years? These, these different references? I want to go back. I want to know what the people at the time of Jesus thought. So, first one I looked at was Philo. Philo was a Hellenistic Jewish philosopher who lived between 20 B.C. and 50 A.D. What did Philo... Now, this is, this is the time of Jesus, right? This is Philo, lived at the time that our Lord lived. And he writes in the works of Philo, the special laws, the Passover, which the Hebrew people call Pascha, on which the people offer sacrifice beginning at noon and continuing till evening. And the festival is instituted in remembrance of and giving thanks for their great migration when they made from Egypt with the myriads of people in accordance with the commands of God given to them. When did he say? Beginning at noon and continuing till evening is the time when they would slay the Passover lamb. This is from Philo, who was a philosopher at the time of Jesus. This is when he says the Jews would sacrifice the lamb. Another one is Flavius Josephus who was, lived from 37 A.D., again, Second Temple period. And from the War of the Jews, Josephus says, So these high priests, upon the coming of the feast, which is called Passover, when they slay their sacrifices from the ninth hour 
to the 11th hour, but we would say from 3 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon, according to Josephus, is when they would sacrifice the Passover. But that wasn't good enough for me. I mean, yeah, I mean, Josephus and Philo, I mean, they were, you know, they were Jews, but were they really the ones that the Jews looked to? I mean, if I'm a Jew in the first century, I want to know what the oral law says. I want to know what the sages and the rabbis say. So I got out my Mishnah. I don't know if you ever read the Mishnah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's riveting. <laughs> but uh, the Mishnah, I actually read it in Connie and Blake. I think, I think Brad liked it. Um, I don't think Connie cared for the Mishnah. But um, I was reading it to him the, about the stuff on the Passover from the Mishnah, the, the rabbinical laws. And what happens now, see, some of the oral traditions are really ridiculous. But, but a lot of what the Mishnah was was dealing with things that were that you couldn't, you know, that the Bible doesn't clearly distinguish. For instance, in this instance, okay, the Jews were to sacrifice the daily sacrifice at Ben Har Abayin, right? Between the evenings. Okay, that was daily. But then the Passover lamb is to be slain at Ben Har Abayim. So pff, what do you do? You got two sacrifices. What is the correct thing to do? Well, this is covered in the Mishnah. Isn't that cool? I just learned this. So in the Mishnah, it says, the daily whole offering was slaughtered a half after the eighth hour and offered up at half after the ninth hour, so between 2 and 3 p.m., 2.30 and 3.30 p.m. But on the eve of the Passover, it was slaughtered at a half after the seventh hour and offered up at a half after the eighth hour, and after this, the Passover offering was sacrificed. So they would offer the daily sacrifice one hour before they would offer the Passover sacrifice. This is in the Mishnah. The Mishnah is, um, if I don't know if I told you exactly what the Mishnah was. The Mishnah is a collection of Jewish and oral traditions of the Pharisees and the sages from the Second Temple period, from 586 B.C. to 70 A.D., Jesus' time. This is what they said about the sacrifice. They also gave a warning in Pesachim 5.3 about the Passover. If it's slaughtered before midday, if you slaughter it before noon... It's invalid, for it's written, Ben Har Abayim, between the evenings. You sacrifice that Passover before noon, doesn't count. Has to be between the evenings. So I felt pretty good now. I feel pretty good that what the Passover was to be slain is in Ben Har Abayim, between the two evenings. And this becomes real significant when we look at Jesus, which we'll look at in a bit. But this was my little thing. Some of you don't really care. Some of you say, huh, that's cool. But anyways, I had to go through that with you to show you how I wanted to look at it myself. I didn't just want to be told. I wanted to read it for myself. And so I did. So that's sometimes the way I roll. <laughs> Exodus 12. Um, so they would slay the Passover lamb, what we would call in the afternoon. Ben Har Abayim, between the evenings. And then at sunset, it said they were to eat the lamb that night. Sunset started a new day, the 15th of Nisan, and that was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And in that first feast of the Passover, they also ate unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And that was the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th. That's talked about in um, Exodus 12, 14 through 17. But let's look at this first observation of the Passover. Exodus 12, uh, 21. Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourself lambs according to your families and slay the Passover. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood with its base and apply some blood that is in the basins to the lintels and the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of the house until morning. For Yahweh will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he set, sees the blood on the lintels, and then the two doorposts, Yahweh will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. 
and you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and for your children forever. And when you enter the land which Yahweh will give you and he will promise you, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to Yahweh who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel when he smote Egyptians but spared our lives and the people bowed and worshipped and they did what Moses said. You follow the record. They did this. They went and they borrowed all the, the jewelry from the Egyptians. That night the Passover came. The, they, were, they, were, uh, they were safe from it, but all the, the Egyptians, their firstborn died. Pharaoh said, go, just get out of here. They spoiled the Egyptians and they left. They left. Two million people left Egypt out of slavery, out of bondage, and they left from the deliverance of the Passover lamb. Now, reading the Mishnah, I also found this little blurb, which I thought this was pretty cool. And this is from Rabin Gamaliel. Now, I don't know if you know in the Bible, Gamaliel was the one at the time of Jesus when they were going to kill him, and he was the Jewish... Uh, uh, teacher that said, you know, if this is a man, it's just going to come to naught. But if what these people are doing is of God, you're not going to be able to fight against it. You won't be able to overcome it. So why don't you just lay off them? And to him, they listened. Gamaliel. And if you remember, Paul was teeter, tutored under Gamaliel. Many, there's, and I, from what I understand, there's several Gamaliels. Um, but this could be that one. I don't know. But look what this Rabbi Gamaliel says in the Mishnah. I just thought this was cool. In what the attitude was towards the Passover lamb. Regarding the Passover, Rabbi Gamaliel used to say, in every generation a man must so regard himself as if he came forth out of Egypt. They were to identify with this. For it is written, And thou shalt tell thy son in that day, saying, It is because of that which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Therefore we are bound to give thanks, to praise, to glorify, to honor, to extol, to bless him who wrought all these wonders for our fathers and for us. He brought, look at this, he brought us out from bondage to freedom, from sorrow to gladness, from mourning to a festival day, from darkness to great light, from servitude to redemption, so let us say before him, hallelujah. Isn't that great? Especially when you think of Jesus later on. This is what these said, this is the attitude you should have about the Passover. Hallelujah. You were brought from bondage to deliverance. You were brought from servitude to redemption. That I thought was cool. See, the, the Mishnah's got some good stuff in it. No, it's, all right. Let's look at Jesus. Turn to the New Testament. Well, let's go to, for, to John, Gospel of John. I already had on the cover slide 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and that's where it says, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, when John the Baptist introduced Jesus, look who he said he is. John chapter 1, verse 29, and the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, what? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God. That's how John the Baptist Introduce Jesus to his disciples. Look at 1 Peter. I have in your notes Isaiah 53, 7. That's one talking about the suffering service was going to be as a lamb that was slaughtered. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with what? The precious blood as of a what? Lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 
We're redeemed with the blood of the Lamb as unblemished, spotless, like the Passover Lamb was to be unblemished of the first year. Look at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. This is when Jesus sacrificed his life. This is when he took his last breath. Luke chapter 23. And in verse 44. <clears throat> Luke 23, 44. It says, it was now, he's hanging on the cross here. And it says, it was now about the sixth hour. Okay, Bible students. Were you paying attention? What time of day is that? Noon. Good, good. And darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. What time of day? 3 p.m. Good. All right. We're tracking. Good job. Because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last breath. Jesus gave his life at Ben Ha, Abayim, between the two evenings. You know, I, I, I love my wife. And one thing she does, which I just love, like if we have, like we'll try a new recipe, right? And it's really good. And it comes out great. She'd be like, come on! Oh, come on. That's good. Come on. When I see this, he died at Ben Ha Abarim. Come on. I mean, come on. That's, oh, that's just a coincidence. Yeah. He died at the time they sacrificed the daily offering. He died at the time they sacrificed the Passover lamb at Ben Ha Abayim. But there's more. John. John. Chapter 19. John 19. John 19. Verse 31, it says, Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. They wanted the, the, the bodies off the cross before sunset, because that started the Sabbath. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man, and the other who was crucified with him, but coming to Jesus when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. So they didn't break the legs of Jesus. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood water rushed out. And he who has seen and testified and testified is true and knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. There's two places where this is uh, fulfilled. One is in Psalms, Psalms 34, talking about a righteous man, his bones will not be broken. But the other is in relation to the Passover lamb. And I gave you the references in Numbers 9, 12 and Exodus 12, 46. It says you are not to break the bone of the Passover lamb. And in the Mishnah, I was going to read this that I didn't, but in the Mishnah, in that section that I was reading on the Pesachim, it says that if they broke the lamb, the, the bones of the lamb, they were going to get 39 lashes. I mean, they were serious about not breaking the bone. I don't know if they ever did that, but that was like, isn't it? I mean, he's dead. And he's fulfilling the law as the sacrificial lamb. No bones, Jesus' bones were not broken, just like the lamb's bones. I mean, come on! 
right? It's just so perfect. It's so wonderful. I mean, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for mankind. And now please go to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5. Here's another thing I just really discovered this week in studying this. If I was to ask you, in the book of Revelation, from your understanding, what do you think is the main title for Jesus? Um, I know for me, for years, I would say like, like the different, like the whole, I think Jesus is, I think he's talked about through the whole Bible. And I would say like in Matthew, he is the king. And I would say in Mark, he is really emphasized as the servant. In, in Luke, I think he's really emphasized as the son of man. In John, he's really emphasized as the son of God. And you can go through all the different verses. And then I used to say in the book of Revelation, he is king of kings and lord of lords, right? And that's what I think of when I think of Jesus in the book of Revelation. But... What is the main title, the main appellation, the main title given to Jesus in the book of Revelation? When I saw this, I went, what? I did. I went, what? Check this out. Appellations of the book of Revelation for Jesus. He is called King of Lord, Kings and Lord of Lords twice. He is called the Root and Offspring of David twice. He's called the first and the last, who is dead and lives again, three times. He is called he that holds the seven stars, four times. He's called Lord, only four times. Most of the usages of Lord, and you look at it in the book of Revelation, is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, who sits on the throne. Not Jesus. God, the Lord God Almighty. Only four times is Jesus referred to as Lord in the book of Revelation. The faithful and true, four times. The one with a sharp sword, and this is like one of them is the two-edged sword, one is the burning sword that comes from his mouth, five times. The word of God. Now some of these I think are Jesus, but let's give them all to Jesus, five times. The Christ, right? The Messiah, ten times. The Lamb, 26 times. In the book of Revelation, he is the Lamb. There is Yahweh, the one who was, who is, and who is to come, Lord God Almighty, and the Lamb. It's all through it. And the introduction of Jesus as the Lamb is here in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5, 1, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book to look at it. Then I began to weep, John says. I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah. There's only one use of lion of Jesus, by the way, that's that one. Um, in the book of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Verse 6, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb. I saw a lamb standing as if it slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a sharp gold bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood Every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. No one above earth, no one below earth, nobody on earth 
could open the seal. No one could redeem every tongue, nation, people, and language from death. Except one. Only one. The perfect sacrifice. Unblemished lamb of the first year. Jesus. The lamb of God. You know, I think about this, and I, I just, I still, I want to study this more, because I, I wonder, what does this mean? But I don't know if you saw that first picture I had up here, a lamb. You ever seen a lamb? A lamb, are, they're innocent, right? They're harmless. They won't hurt anybody. They're meek. You know, they can't even help themselves. They're humble. And this one, who didn't deserve to die, who had done nothing wrong, who was perfect, died for us. That's the Lamb of God. That's the Passover Lamb for us that was sacrificed. What do you say to such things? You say, verse 11, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels saying around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the numbers of them were myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, all the angels, all the hosts of heaven. And what do they say? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor, and glory, and blessing in every created thing which is in the earth, in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and the sea, and all of them heard everything on earth, said to him who sits on the throne, Yahweh, the one who was, who is to come, the Almighty God, and to the Lamb, the Son of God, the perfect man who gave his life for us, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures set saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Lord, that he took us from darkness to light that he took us from servitude to freedom. He took us from death to everlasting life. And he took us from all the sin that we had and he redeemed us and purchased us so that we could live eternally with our God and with the Lamb of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 